Cool. Okay. Thank y'all for joining us. Happy UMS 2023. Holy whoa. Happy Disability Pride Month. Um, happy, happy to be here and have this conversation about access needs and access around not just our hometown festival, but the big, the big wig festival. And um, yeah, wanted to share some of my favorite disabled artists around um, and like our relationship to our access needs, all being um, out disabled folks. And you know, it's a loaded conversation. Uh, it's personal. So, so really appreciate the vulnerability of all of us panelists. Um, just want to make sure to like bring this to everybody because access is universal. Access needs are universal. Um, disability will impact us all <laughs> in one way or another. So, um, yeah, we don't have a ton of time um, and we have amazing people to share our, our perspectives. So I just, instead of doing like our classic introduction, um, I was hoping to introduce everybody, um, get your name, and if you're open to discussing your access needs around your disability and how that relates to your work, which will, will tell us a little bit about what you do. Jessica, you maybe want to start us off since you're over there in the corner? No. Javier, start us off. Okay, can everybody hear me? Sounds like it. Okay, my name is Javier Flores. I'm an artist and educator, and really difficult, challenging, trying to talk over this song, um, yeah. which is lovely. <laughs> um, but uh, my access needs and how, um, I'm an educator in visual arts. Um, I teach at Front Range Community College in Westminster, and so I feel like the things that impede me or are become my access needs in my occupation, I think are the biggest things are uh, physicality. Um, I'm able to move things and I'm lucky enough to be able to have motion in my arms and um, as to where like a lot of quads aren't even given that opportunity. So I'm really lucky in that opportunity to be able to move things around, but at the same time, I still um, require height um, adaptations um, and one of the things, like, I'm sure we'll get to it at some point, but like one of the things that it's pretty universal, I think, for a lot of people in chairs in general and people in general is um, access to bathrooms and that they actually function as a, a handicap stall. You know, that they had the right measurements, the, the, um, the um, braces, all those kinds of things. Um, but other than that, I feel... Um, I feel like murals and graffiti are probably where I like falter the most to be able to reach certain heights of, as far as physicality. Cool. Uh, Lisa or Terry, you wanna you wanna jump in? Sure. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Carrie Gray. Um, she her pronouns. As a visual description, I'm a light-skinned black woman currently walking some kind of corn roll, tribal braids type of thing, gold jewelry. Um, and you'll see this background, plants, earthy, it's giving that. Um, and uh, I run a consulting business um, where I help companies and organizations around disability and racial justice, the inclusion of particularly BIPOC people with disabilities in um, different employment settings and shifting organizational cultures. Um, for me, I am a cancer survivor and um, I have a amputation uh, due to my cancer and I wear a prosthetic limb on my right leg. Um, and I also have hearing loss um, due to um, cancer and things to that nature. So for me, uh, when I be in festival settings, you'll often see me riding around on a, a Segway, <laughs> zooming around from side to side, trying to preserve my energy, uh, making it from place to place. 
And um, I do at times use like captions and things that nature um, to help me catch things that are going on in the conversation. Or I'm the person I'll be like, can you repeat that? I really just didn't quite, you know. <laughs> um, I'm really excited to be with y'all today and um, discuss more about this topic. Yay, thanks for, thanks for being here. Beautiful, beautiful. Hi, beautiful people. My name is Alicia. Lisa Young, my pronouns are she, her. I too, for visual description, am a beautiful bronze buxom babe. I have, uh, today, I am wearing a red um, scarf and I have on a black and white top. I normally wear glasses, but today I do not have them on. I am sitting in front of an elephant. Uh, which I love that. I love elephants. Elephants remind me to remember. And um, <clears throat> just so you all are aware, I had my first stroke when I was 14 and a half years old. I live with hidden disabilities. So a lot of people see me. And the first thing is if I pull up into, you know, the disabled parking, I've had people yell at me saying, what are you doing there? Shame on you taking those poor disabled people's spot. Um, I've had people question, like you might see me. Um, currently, I am transi transitionally using a motorized scooter for long distance. Um, I have left-sided weakness, and sometimes I get very trippy and I fall. Um, but I also right now am living with a back fracture that happened from work and I have a cane. So um, if I'm in the house and I have walls and, and tables and chairs that I can hold on to, I may not use the cane. So there's the need of access of understanding too for those of us who live with hidden disabilities and how sometimes pain might be the, uh, the, the one thing that is making uh, us have a more needy day, needing more tools and more um, prompts even. Another thing that I live with is I have ADHD and some other cognitive disabilities from having a stroke at a very young age. Um, live with PTSD and some mental health issues too. Um, so for me in the work that I do, it, it's really imperative that I advocate for myself my access needs almost constantly because I function as a normal person because people don't see a wheelchair. They don't see a limb or hearing aid or cane or something. They make assumptions about how well or unwell that I am. I also live with chronic asthma. So like in the last couple of weeks in Denver and everywhere else around the world, I've not been able to breathe. I've been coughing up big, ugly globs of brown sputum, you know, sputum. So um, I could go from being very well to being very unwell in a matter of minutes and having people say things like, oh, it's an act because I am an actor. So I'm in the performance arts and that's uh, pretty much my story. I mean, there's other, you know, things about access that we could get into. <laughs> uh, you know, Kaylin, you and I were talking about how Access to clean air, clean water is an access need that everybody has. And um, when we speak to people who don't understand why we might need extra access to, um, you know, if I'm in a wheelchair, that's when I find out some of these doors. Oh, my gosh. I'm trying to maneuver a wheelchair and open a door at the same time to have the upper body strength to open a door, you know. So, yeah. Thank you. Jessica. Okay, I'll go now. Oh, good. So my name is Jessica Wallach, and I'm one of the access team here. I'm an artist, educator, mostly around camera work. Um, this is my work. Um, access needs. More, I have cerebral palsy from birth, and more and more I get exhausted. And so I am using um, the scooter for the last six months. Um, I'm very much going back and forth. So you'll see me walking around today and you'll see me scooting. And I think, 
I went upstairs twice and in the back a few times and I think I'm done. I am done being on my feet. So access needs, yeah, doors. I think bathrooms and like I never understood door handle buttons like I do now that I'm in this. Like, can I touch it, get back, and get in place? Like, they're just not. Um, so I'm looking forward to the day when it's all sensor-based and not you need to hit it. Um, and then I have two other big access needs. One is eyes. For me to process, I process that loud. So I'm always bringing people in. Um, and sometimes it's just an access need. It just is. I don't know if it's my personality or my disability, but that's how I operate, right? And then, um, oh, right. So then it's just a piece of respect. I have the speech difference. Folks with CP have a huge range of speech differences. And for me, I never know if you're patronizing me or liking me, right? So you have to work really hard to show me respect. So I know that it's that you like me because what happens is people notice that I'm speaking differently and then they don't think I'm as brilliant as they are. And it's the ableism, right? It is not anyone's fault. It is really, we are 50 years out of the ugly laws. We are, you know, 30 years into ADA. It is still thick out there. And so, um, but it's a big access need that I can't tell if you're patronizing me or respecting me. Cool, thank you. Um, I'm gonna moderate this discussion because I talk in Denver all the time about myself, but I do I do want to answer uh, this question and hopefully the last. Um, yeah, I have been lucky to help lead the access initiative here at the UMS for the first time ever. I am a performer. Um, I am an artist outside of performing now, but for the most part, uh, I play concerts and access needs is something that I wasn't really introduced to until much later in my life, actually not that long ago through Family Theater Company. And it was the first time that I watched a giant group of people be asked, what are your access needs? How can we help? Where are you at today? And we did that every single day with a cast of 26 people with disabilities. Um, every time we rehearsed, we checked in on access needs. Actually went on a double date recently where we checked in on access needs halfway through the date. And um, it's just really like changed the way I show up to my classrooms, to performances, to work, to organizations. I'm like, wow, every group of people could benefit from just disclosing your access needs. And also recognizing that it's hard to ask for what you need, especially when things are so hard. Um, my access needs are changing quite a bit as I age. Um, they change throughout the day. Uh, they change because of the climate catastrophe. Um, I if I travel in my power chair, which I haven't done until more recently, I need a lot more access to public, to accessible transportation, which is a nightmare. Even here at home in Denver, being the first uh, city to make public transit accessible, we don't have lifts, we don't have Ubers, we don't have taxis, like you could get stuck downtown so easily going to shows, going out dancing. If you miss that last bus, like, you know, we're in a cow town and you're fucked. So, um, yeah, I just got off like a really hellish travel week playing a show for 
a disability festival. And even with like all the help, all the resources, all the money, Miss Wheelchair New York, like by my side, texting everybody, we were left stuck. We were left stranded. Um, I was so desperate asking cops for help. Cops weren't helping. Uh, it was just like one thing after the next to the point that like by the end of the week and even, even this week going into UMS, I'm mad as hell. I'm tired as hell. I'm like on edge. And so asking for what I need is difficult because I'm just like trying to make it through, you know? So uh, yeah, transportation, housing, bathrooms, obviously a big one and one that I haven't prioritized for myself for a lot of times because I grew up in an inaccessible house. I never could get in and out of my house by myself. Never could close the door in the bathroom. I still don't really close the door in the bathroom. Um, so yeah, again, like that's shifting. It's changing within me. I definitely ask for like a smaller boom stand of a microphone uh, so that it's not like in in the front of every photo, this big crane of a, of a <laughs> microphone. Um, that's like a little thing that I ask for on my writer. Um, I asked for a small table for my laptop. And, and again, like I don't ask for an accessible stage typically unless I'm in my power chair because I just, the, the, the commonality is that stages are not accessible. And um, yeah, I'm a little less likely to let people carry me anymore. So um, yeah, cool. Um, Thanks for sharing. I wanted to, Carrie, if you wouldn't mind telling us about, as you know, um, the UMS here, here in Denver, three-day festival, over 200 bands. This is the 20-something year. And it's our first year of trying to tackle accessibility. Um, and I know you did such amazing work with Coachella to make it accessible for people with disabilities. Um, could, you, could you share with us that program, how it went, what you learned, anything, any, we, I would love to hear. Definitely, um, super appreciate that. Y'all stories, I'm really receiving something hearing y'all talk today. Um, so for me, I, I get the pleasure of working with a variety of different um, clients across various industries that mostly come, I come in and I make it really easy for staff and our teams to talk about disability and mental health in the workplace. You know, one of the things that we're doing is we're trying to increase the number of people with disabilities in the industry but we also know like the culture also has to be transformed in that work for us to stay in the workplace. So we do a lot of work around that. Um, but every so often I get a, a, a special opportunity to build a program. And uh, there's a company called Golden Voice and uh, I just don't know who I'm talking to in the audience. So I'm gonna break just a couple things down. Um, Golden Voice runs a company called Coachella uh, which is a magical place. Festivals are just that. They're creating magic um, in live events. And I currently serve as the impact producer for Coachella's Accessible Plus program um, that was founded by Austin Whitney, Sabira Naji, and Coachella's festival director, Cole. And Accessible Plus is essentially this like really immersive experience where we bring in um, we bring in a uh, 20 total BIPOC disabled people, um, you know, who are all interested in being in live events. Some of them are artists, some of them are production, some of them are interested in marketing. Like, you know, we, we bring them in and we're building community, you know, to come together. It's essential that we know each other, that we're, you know, building that camaraderie. Um, we come in and we discuss festival accessibility. The more that our community is out there, we're learning about all of the different things that we could adjust to make the festivals more accessible. We have, for instance, these like large scanners uh, across the festival that scan your credentials. 
And as we're talking to our participants, they're telling us how they're too tall, like, you know, depending on your disability, having to reach out your arm and, you know, standing atop this thing is, is, is a challenge. And so, you know, we're discussing festival accessibility and we're also learning about the professional opportunities that are out there, right? Like we want our community dreaming about being vendors for festivals, about being artists, about being all sorts of things in the industry. You know, this program was definitely inspired by the barriers that our community faces, um, you know, specifically when it comes to employment. We see that people with disabilities only are about like 40% in the labor force. So that means only 40% of our population is actually even considered to be working. Whereas if you're not disabled, 76% of folks are in the actual labor force. It's wild, the disparities. And, turn, and that's like unemployment. I'll just look at that. We're uh, two times as unemployed as a person without a disability. So we built this program knowing there were gonna be obstacles, knowing there were gonna be things that have been happening that would make it a challenge, but we're determined what we ended up doing is Coachella is, is, is a very large, you know, space. It, it, it has about 125,000 people each weekend. And we have a camping element where about people participate. So what we did is we had to imagine what is an accessible campground for our community to be able to stay there and participate in the festival. So we built it from scratch. We had to think about our transportation system, which I'm so glad you mentioned accessible transportation, it's such an issue um, that we really have to come together on or. But at least when you're on site, you have accessible transportation, the number of golf carts that we're delegating is very, very important. Collaborating with the ADA department, having a strong relationship, but not just with a our program was ground did an intersectionality like, everybody our cousin and we want all our cousins to come together for this program so we work with for instance gv black the black erg um, that's connected to golden voice and we build initiatives together to represent our community we march together through that collaboration um, we brought in bipoc owned vendors we brought in speakers industry experts we created job shadowing opportunities and our mentors in the program, they are rooting for our community. They are saying, listen, I'm going to make sure that my mentee has a photo cred so that she can take photos, build her resume and experience up and land some opportunities. So the programs, you know, for us, our aim was how do we destigmatize disability across the industry? How do we open doors for folks who just haven't traditionally been hired, been around to be genuinely a part of the industry? How do we increase the talent pool of BIPOC disabled folks? And, you know, the final thing I'll mention is, is, you know, for us, this is grounded in innovation and imagination, right? Like we want to imagine festivals, they're magical. But we want to see a combination of what I would consider Wakanda and Crip Camp. Who am I talking to? Who knows Crip Camp? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Shout out to Netflix. Shout out to Judy Human. Um, you can watch it on Netflix. But a combination of those worlds coming together. That is what we envision. So... Oh, uh, for us, I don't. I hope that answers your question. Let me know. But you know, that's what we're building, and you know, really want to encourage that imagination, that innovation, and finding collab uh, collaboration <laughs> in order for this to happen. Yeah, I love that. Thank you for painting the picture, and and just really like, it really sometimes does take these mag magic fantasy futurist things to like, hey, we want Wakanda, we want it to be like Wakanda, but Crip Camp, <laughs> like, you know, and that's like such a, yeah, such a beautiful way to like try to build an experience is by like learning from those two, two pools. Uh, thank you. Uh, I hope to go someday, but whoa, it's, I, yeah, I just don't even like consider going to those festivals as an attendee. 
I, of course, as a performer, like I'm gonna get a Coachella show, I'm definitely going one way or the other, but camping, trekking through, yeah, it just seems like, whoa, whoa. In the heat, yeah. Um, Jessica, would you mind, over this drum beat, um, t telling us uh, what, what you and I have been working on uh, this year for the UMS, um, yeah, kind of like what we, what we envisioned for this first year and the years going forward. How, how, how's it been? What are we doing? Thank you. Um, well, I, what we're doing in this first year is we're gathering information, right? We're gathering information and we're experimenting with how to get information out, right? So we've done some surveys, we've gone around and we've talked to all the venues and we've done a lot of in-house talking. And then we put together uh, an access guide and we have extensive notes that we are sharing with all the venues. Um, and then we've developed a small cohort of folks who are coming. We have access paths for them and they will give us feedback and we're hoping to develop a long-term relationship with those folks. So that's really the first year. And, and in that, we've done all this education of the staff. And so we've made all these small changes this year, really shovel ready. And access is in the details. Really, I forgot to say one of my access needs is really a space that feels welcoming when you have a really, really tight number of chairs like we had here in the beginning of the day. Um, I was like, ooh, maybe I'll just hang out in the back, right? Even though the, the idea is that we would just move out chairs so that People could have a space anywhere, right? A really, that's a great practice people have, but it just felt so tight that I couldn't even envision myself pulling out a chair. Um, so it's in the details, and I think this first year is really developing an acuity of paying attention to all the details, right? And then next year, we're really looking at, okay, what would, it, what would it take for us to really do a big push on accessibility, right? And we'll put a bunch of things into place. Oh, the other big thing we're doing this year is just observing, 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 right? So you'll see Kaylin and I both at the access booth and throughout the footprint looking to see who's having access to what, right? And what is the built environment and what does it mean to have so many people in this space? Because the biggest barrier is actually the number of people we have and how do we, how do we play around with that, right? Um, and so next year we'll do this big push and the third year another big push and then access is never ending, right? We, once you get people in the door, you figure out the next set of access needs. It's that people are dynamic, that we want to connect, and we just need to keep building those avenues for connecting. And I'm going to say my big goal is to make UMS, as I want to make so many spaces, a love letter to the body. What, you know, what UMS is, these impact days started last year with artists care. And really what artists do not get to think about our bodies. We are just supposed to work and work and work. And what would it mean if we got to think about our bodies? So, Accessibility just sits right 
nestled in with artist care. It is not something separate or different, but it's central. We all have bodies and we all have access needs. I just want to, oh, hey, hey, oh yeah. Oh yeah, ring me baby. Um, I just want to add too that like, yeah, I think we both feel like we have so much more work to do. So much more. We're still, you know, in a building right now that the elevator's broken. None of us are going to be able to go upstairs for all the great events. And, and that's also access is adapting, right, to the climate, to people's needs. We've had people requesting access because their partner got injured. We've got people who like, yeah, it's a very universal thing. And I just wanted to add that like the feedback that we've got has been so sweet and such a like nice thing to come home to from such a hell ride of inaccess is like just taking like really detailed notes on every venue, which, you know, it's a lot of venues up and down Broadway. It's like, hey, this bathroom, you could get in, but you can't shut the door. Hey, this bathroom is pretty tight. I wouldn't go there. Hey, this bathroom, uh, this venue has really not good ventilation if you're COVID conscious, which you should be. Uh, don't go there. Or, hey, this, this place has really good ventilation, open ceilings. Um, we got tests. We got COVID tests at the first aid booth. Um, we got masks. Like, yeah, just... Just the, the work that we put in already, I've never seen at any festival that I played at. And it feels, as with any, any kind of movement work, that we still have so far to go, but I, ju I just feel really good about what we've already done. And, yeah. and the feedback has been very affirming that like, whoa, nobody's ever talked to me about ways that I could participate in this thing that like matters so much to our city. So yeah, right yeah. on, Jessica. Um, Lisa, could you tell us how you see access needs show up in the theater world, which is, is more your bag and obviously like music intersects within that, but you know, Denver has a really big theater we're a theater town um, here in Chicago, another theater town. Uh, how, do, how do access needs show up in, in your world? Well, I, I want to 100% um, piggyback and dovetail on the words that have already been spoken into space because honestly, the same needs, because the same needs that you might find at a Coachella, at a music festival, at a concert hall, um, anywhere there are people with bodies, broken or otherwise, you know, somebody needs to be the magician behind the curtain that sees these things. I'm so happy to hear that you're taking notes to move forward. But one thing I want to take uh, a moment for is that access should be at the top of budgeting right along with everything else. If you're thinking about where the food vendors are gonna be, where the bathrooms are gonna be, you need to be thinking as we are planning these things, five, 10, three, one year out, we need to be putting access into the budget. I have seen time and time again, you know, the response has been, oh, we would love to have ASL. We would love to have closed captioning. We would love to have, you know, uh, more accessible seating options. We would love, but we just don't have the budget. And the thing is, when you're out there seeking funding for flying in a helicopter, and I'm talking about a particular uh, theater show where there's a helicopter in it, and these theater companies, and I'm talking about major equity houses, have brought in live helicopters that they figure out how to work on a stage before they figure out how maybe to put someone in a wheelchair onto that very same stage that may not have access in trees through ramps and other things or have bathrooms or dressing rooms. And I mean, I could take an hour 
to go on to how theater has been inaccessible on the stage, in the audience, from outward facing, um, like as I was here traveling and I was like, oh, I'd love to go see some great theater. And I just wanted to go and see what theater companies and how do I get ADA seating and things like that. And it was such a hassle to just gain entry into their ticketing space before I even get to the door to get into the building. It's like figuring out how to get an ADA ticket or a ticket where, um, hey, I might be using a wheelchair and I'm bringing friends with me. Can we get seats together? It's like a whole rigmarole on just finding out that information. So theater is taking steps. They might be ant steps. I'm not even going to say baby steps. These are like little teeny tiny amoebic you know, slides forward um, where um, – now I will brag on some of the things that I've seen. And one of you, you mentioned, you brought this name into space, Family Theater Company, and that is spelled P-H-A-M-A-L-Y. Family stands for Physically Handicapped Actors and Musical Artists League. And it was created over 36 years ago by a group of um, wheelchair users who uh, back before ADA was, uh, you know, a national uh, mandate, they were kids who went to school and at the school, they were at the better school. They were able to do theater together. And then when they grew up and they were, you know, adults, the opportunity stopped for them. No one wanted to audition them. No one wanted to even give them time to figure out how to get them in the theater, how to get them on the stage. You know, the answer was just like, oh, we don't know how to keep you safe. You're blind. Oh, we don't want you to fall off the stage. And I'm like, you're talking to people who cross major downtown streets in Denver, Colorado with light rails and, and cars and everything. And you're going to, uh, you know, ableist talk to them and say, we want to keep you safe. Let's take fishing wire and put across the stage to keep you from falling off the stage. So that to me was the dark ages of, of where of accessibility and, um, opening, you know, doors to folks living with disability was. But now um, family has, um, also with my organization, which is Ideas, Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, Access on Stages, we are forward thinking. It is like, how do we go out and seek out groups of blind, deaf, autistic folks and tell them, hey, these are the days that we have ASL and closed captioning. If that doesn't work for you, when can we get a group of you all to come in or you all to be on our board and help us create the accessibility uh, um, structure, that infrastructure that we need in our theater? Or if you're speaking to sensory friendly performance is where we turn the lights up and the music down. People can walk around if they need to stem, if they need to take a breather, go out into the hall and not necessarily uh, be in such a jarring environment. If people need to vocalize, the actors are trained to keep doing the show. It's not something for you to stop and be distracted by. You know, that's the one thing is flexibility because the dynamics of the human condition are so different. Disability comes in many different sizes, flavors, shapes, <laughs> and expressions. Um, one great thing that I see that has been incorporated into theater is taking almost all programming onto online digitalized uh, sources that can be read by digital readers, QR codes, as opposed to the paper glut that programs have, which, you know, are we being kind to Mother Nature? You know, let's green up some theater, too. Um, where everyone can access the program through QR codes or going online to, to read and making sure that, like I said, that the programming is readable by screen readers. Um, website accessibility for folks who are living and, and might be blind or might have low vision um, Y'all, we need to start looking at all of our access points, right? Folks who are on the phone, if, um, if somebody's calling in and they're deaf and they have an interpreter who's coming in, 
then you know you need to have your folks on your end trained that this conversation might take a little bit longer. Um, these are things that I've seen that have been changing. Um, I do love the fact that some theater companies will see. Huh? Lisa. Lisa, we lost you. With Ilgen, uh, for the day of. I'm sorry? We, we, you froze oh, no. on us. Um, but I do want to, I do want to say you have. Okay, am I back? You're back and you've had a lot of claps in the audience. A lot of claps and a lot of snaps for everything you've been saying. So, thank you. Thank you. I, I love you. It. Thank you for sharing. Um, I wanted to piggyback off too that you're right about budgeting being such a common thing that we're told, oh, we can't afford it, we can't afford it. And um, oh, is it my wife? it's so frustrating because when we make things accessible for people with disabilities, we make it accessible for everybody. It benefits everybody. Nobody is mad about having ramps on the corners of our sidewalk. No musician is ever going to throw a fit because there's a ramp or a lift now to get all their gear up, right? Like, again, disability happens overnight <laughs> in the midday. Um, it's coming for you all. Keep living. <laughs> My grandmother said, keep living, baby, yeah. because at the end of our lives, we all become more that's, disabled that's, than able. That's right. You know? And um, yeah, I've just, I just really appreciate you being like, no, they should be at the forefront. and. And we got to stop like putting the burden on people with disabilities that already are asked to do so much more work, spend so much more money. I mean, we've been told this weekend even that like we can't do things because alcohol sales or, you know, maybe next year we can do these things. And, and again, like we've been able to do so much, but it's like, I, I, I really appreciate that, like, we got to move past, like, we'd love to, but it's like, no, if you'd love to, then you will. And, and please keep an eye out for people this weekend, not just disability related. If you see somebody that's thirsty, that needs help, like, we all need to do this together. Um, before, before we Wait, jump back. can I you, say one more thing on budget? Yeah, please. Okay, this is a Betty Siegel of the Kennedy Center quote, but I really like it that our events should be no bigger than our access budget can hold. You need to move it, you need to do it from the very, very beginning, as Lisa said, and you need to really think in terms of how big you can be is how big you can include everybody. Javier, my man, my man. What up? Um, closing out here, and, and we're going to like leave you with some things to be thinking about for your future, for our future, um, and we'll stick around for Q&A because we won't have time to do it on the mic. But, Javier, how do you see access needs show up in the visual art world? You, as a, a screen printer, that's heavy heavy labor um you're also in a classroom all the time art studio how does how do access needs show up in your world um in multiple ways um oh man okay so i've been writing notes as y'all have been talking and great great conversation with everybody um so some of the biggest things that i find even just in the classroom is maneuverability right i'm in a chair i've told my instructors and and to tell their students to make a path around the area of the of the room so I can have access, and uh, it just goes by the wayside. You know, every single semester, every single class period, and so it's little things like that. Um, in the gallery, which I also curate at the school, um, it's little things like height of where you hang work. Um, you know, it's it's usually 58 to 60 inches at the median point, and then the work will sit, the work's supposed to sit with that as the medium in the middle. And um, 
that has no accountability for us who are sitting lower or even people that are shorter, you know, just people that are just at a shorter stature, little kids, you know, it really denies a whole populace of uh, being able to achieve and and um, access art in a and, and it's something that should be more universal. Um, one of the things I was thinking about is storage. You know, being able to put things away and having to have to ask for help when I could do it physically, but it's just I can't reach it. Um, also, microaggressions of ableism, um, pro and con. Uh, overestimating my abilities sometimes. I'm like, yeah, I know I'm a badass, but there's things I cannot physically do. And I would love to, but I can't. And so there's those things. Um, con, not taking into account um, the physicality of how things will work in relationship to my, my chair. Um, you know, there's, there's just heaps of things, you know, um, the way that we've traditionally done things, especially, especially like screen printing you mentioned. Screen printing, you have to normally like cover over the screen. I have to do it at the side and full and have to use all my physicality in my arms where uh, people that are able-bodied are able to just sit on top of it and use their body weight to pull. Um, it's, there's lots of things. Um, one thing I did want to touch on is, and because we're at a music showcase, is don't be the tallest six foot dude in the room and stand right in front of the person in the wheelchair. Inevitably, it always happens. The tallest person in the room comes and just like hovers. It's like a magnet for, for me. Like they just like come into my zone and then all of a sudden they're right in front of me. Um, my, we went to The Cure, my girlfriend and I at Fiddler's Green and if you've ever been to Fiddler's Green, if you're on, uh, if you're not on the lawn, you're fine. But if you're on the lawn and you're trying to get vis visual uh, sight of the of the band, it's such a it's such a hassle. And like I had this twirling six foot something kid right in front of me, and then um, a few other people. My girlfriend went up and politely asked, "Hey guys, do you guys mind sitting down?" Um, and one of the responses from one of the women was, "Are you an usher?" And she's like, she's like, no, but my boyfriend's in a wheelchair and he can't see, so would you do the kind thing? And You're they're like, like, we're not sitting down. And You're she's like, like, well. No, but I know Usher and yeah. he will beat your ass. Well, we, well, and, <laughs> well and, and she got really pissed, right? She's, she got super mad to the point where she was crying. And like, that hurt me because I don't want to see her, uh, you know, our partners take on our, our disabilities too and like the access needs as well. And, and she was like, so mad and I was like you say the word and I'm stabbing everybody in yeah, front of yeah, us yeah, yeah. I was like but we're going to prison um, you know well I want <laughs> you to know that we did have you in mind when we created this year's like accessible spaces in venues awesome. what we didn't want to do is like have this weird section that's separated from everybody else and whether or not people used it it's like this is only for Wheelchairs. So what we did, the messaging is like, hey, this space is reserved for sitters and shorties that might need it. And if they do, please move and like be aware of your surroundings. Stay mindful, party on. Um, because again, this like messaging isn't just about those of us in wheelchairs. It's about little people. It's about kids. It's about people who hurt their ankles on those scooters. You know, we're here for everybody. So um, thank you again for this conversation. I hate to jump because we could talk for hours about all of this, but there's a really big band up there and they're getting loud. Uh, the show has begun. Um, if Please give it up for our great panelists, Carrie Gray. Alicia, Lisa Young, Javier Flores, Jessica Wallach. If you got questions, you know where to find us.